Today's wish comes from Dr. Marie Aline Pelletier, MH for short. Marie is a psychologist with a systems mind, applying two decades of clinical experience with senior leadership roles across multiple sectors. MH is a member of the World Health Organization's Global Clinical Practice Network and is the past director on the boards of the Canadian Psychological Association, as well as the International Association of Applied Psychology. Her latest book, and it's a good one, is The Resilience Plan, a strategic approach to optimizing your work performance and mental health. Maria Lean, welcome to the show. Joe, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. All right, MH for short, from here on out. It's going to be yes. easier. <laughs> so, so MH, what do you wish more people knew? I wish more people knew that you cannot wing or will yourself to be resilient. You have to be strategic about your resilience. Okay, so resilience is the act of bouncing back. But as you make very clear in the book, that requires a strategy. It's not just a sentiment. So tell us a little about, if you can, how we can develop this plan of resilience. Tell us more about that. Exactly. Um, well, the same way you would develop a plan when, when in business, you create a strategy to launch a new product or a new service. You look at the values you're bringing. You look at your current context, the forces in the market that could influence it. Same thing here. You're looking at your values. You're looking at your sources of supply and demand right now, not in general, in this phase. You are looking at your overall context, both personal and external to you, what helps and what doesn't, much like you would do with the proven tools of SWOT analysis in business. And from there, you're creating your strategic plan with tactics and action, or actions, obviously, that actually correspond to your reality, which means you are much more likely to implement them and move forward with even more resilience. Tell me about supply and demand, because I, you know, we think about that in terms of economics. You position that in a different context here in the space of mental health. What do you mean by that? I know. And it's possibly one of the parts of the reflections that I most often hear feedback on. So what I tell people here is on a sheet of paper, always easier to do it external to you. You actually write down all your sources, current and real sources of supply, what brings you energy. So not what you wish you did three times a week exercise, what you actually did in the past two weeks. If you did zero exercise, if all you did is manage to eat the salad once, okay, that goes on the list. But we're realistic because otherwise we will tend to overestimate what we do. Oh yeah, I've got lots of sources of supply because we're high performers and all these things. <laughs> Not here. Realistic. And on the demand side, anything that demands some of your energy, your cognitive energy, your emotional energy, your actual physical energy. And it could be demands on the professional side and the personal side. We need both, even if our goal is professional, because we're all in one. And I also want the demands that we wish we had, like this next promotion we just got, which is super exciting, still a demand, or demands that we wish we didn't have, like co-parenting with a parent we have challenges with right now, for example. It, because that's the other problem. As high achievers, we tend to minimize all this. And so if we you know, overestimate the supply, underestimate the demand, of course, we're going to do nothing about any of this because we think we're good. Mm. Yeah. So supply are the things that bring us that energy, demands to the things that sap that energy. And we need to have a clear sense of those things, plus our values and the overall context in which all of this is happening in order to really have a sense of where we stand right now in terms of our mental fitness. Exactly. Yeah. So anxiety and burnout, these are two real big problems today at work and beyond. They have this way of creeping up on us, don't they? Right? Like slowly at first and then all at once. The best way to get ahead of them is to spot those early warning signs when they're still small. So what are some of the ways that we can become more aware? I know. And that's it. We all wish that, right? Because in business, we would never say, oh, you know, don't, let, don't tell me if there's small signs. I only want to know the crisis. <laughs> you know, we would, never, we would say, I want visibility. I want proaction. I, you know, all these things. So we look at financial statements at least quarterly. If we spot any kind of unusual thing, we're on it, right? We need, we don't do the same thing for our resilience. <laughs> it's as if we wait until this is a red flashing light over here. 
So we need to look at signs early. And so, for example, for burnout, three main signs of actual burnout here are exhaustion, cynicism, and significant impact on our performance. So the earlier signs here, maybe before you get exhausted, you're, you have less energy. Before you get cynical, you le you're less engaged. You don't feel the love as much as you, know, you used to for what, what you do. And before you get to significant performance issues, more things are falling through the cracks. Mm. The problem is we've all been there. I'm listing these things and I'm like, oh yeah, mate, you've been there. And you know, you're know, you nodding, Joe, looking at me. So we've been there. What we do is we, again, minimize all this. We think, oh, it's mm. normal. I'm stressed. It's normal. I've got so much. Yes, it's understandable in this context. And we want to pay attention the same way we would in business with early signs on a financial statement an interim financial statement. So we need to do more frequent check-ins, very concrete way. You put a sheet of paper at a place in your home where, that you visit every night, where you brush your teeth, for example, and put on the zero to 10 scale, how were you feeling overall today? This will take you seconds but at least, and you know, you may argue it's not a formally approved uh, measure, but it will be internally consistent because it's you filling it every night. It will show you if you're going from nine to eight and a half to seven to five, you'll catch it slow as sliding down before you're at 0.5 over here. Mm. That's yeah, so an the, example. It is, it's key to catch it early. So like with anything, prevention is, is the key and awareness is the key to prevention. Yes. All right. So awareness is important, but so is action, right? At the end of the day, if we want to be effective, we don't need these grand gestures like the ones you, you know, just talked about. Small things, grounded practices seem to be the difference makers. So tell us about some of the ways that we might act ourselves into a new way of thinking so that we can be at our best. I know. And these will be small. And here's why. The reality is anyone here listening to this has a very full life, probably overflowing with how you're trying to use your time and optimize it. So we're not going to go for big uh, changes that no one has time for. And it will be very personal to each of us. For example, often high-performing individuals I have in my executive coaching practice will have as a value health, for example. When looking at their sources of supply and demand, eh, maybe they've now finally made sure they make it to a one yoga class per month, or right. they get on their bike once a week inside or outside. And so, and then we look at their context. An example of a pillar that may be part of their moving forward strategy for the next few months, right? Because just like in business, it evolves. They may have a pillar that's called boundaries. And within that pillar, they may have an action that says once a week, I stop work for sure at a certain time, you decide. 5 p.m., 6 p.m., whatever your time is. And at that moment, I'm going to do a four-minute online-based, on an app, yoga exercise. Or I will go on my bike for five minutes. So you're making it so small that it's very doable. And of course, that amount, five minutes, is not going to be life-changing from a physical or a psychological help. But here's what happens. What you've now done is you've started taking action to your point. Now, psychologically, it does change something. It changes now your sense of self-efficacy. I can actually impact this situation. And from there, you can build. Yeah, it's true. I, I find myself even, as long as I take that first step, I feel like I'm on the way towards building out a better me when it comes to these personal tasks and challenges that I've set for myself. So shrink it, and then you're able to scale it. That's right. And personalized to you because your yeah. next shrunk thing will be different from mine or mm. yours in six months from now. Yeah. And I like the fact that it's so small, it's so doable and, and yet so practical. So that sense of practicality and that sense of person, you know, personalization, that combination is really effective. Yes. Yes. So these are great ways for individuals to sort of deepen their resilience. And as you say throughout the book, you know, developing that strategy really does start with us. I am wondering, though, for my leaders out there, what can they do to help build resilience within their teams, to help create this sense of collective resilience? What have you found that works? 
Yes, yes. And research does give us a number of directions to consider that will increase resilience in our teams, uh, will decrease, actually mitigate risk of burnout uh, within, within teams, which all of us, I mean, it's hard enough to find fabulous team members. We want to keep them and, and keep them well, happy and healthy and contributing, of course. So, and it will depend from, you know, from team to team, but I'll give you some ideas in general. And the first thing, I'm just going to say three for, for right now. First thing, of course, you got to walk that talk Whatever you decide to do for your own resilience, tell them. So for example, if you decided this weekend to do the thing that you know will increase your resilience, don't just say, I had a good weekend, I went for a hike. Say, I had a good weekend, I went for a hike in order to make sure I build as much of my resilience as I can because we're busy over here. So you're normalizing that we take these actions. You're sharing your humanness, which from a trust in the team perspective also helps. So you want to walk the talk and say it, do and be seen as doing, very important. The second uh, I'm going to say here, and there are others, but this one is again, practical, easy to implement today, literally increase recognition. So uh, you're a good leader. You're already thanking team members at times, right? You can do it more. Find the things that people do that you can be recognized. And yes, sometimes recognition is a thank you. Sometimes recognition is, could you go to this inter-department inter, uh, team meeting instead of me for right now? You're delegating, you're giving them an opportunity to expand their visibility within the organization. That is recognition. So increase recognition. You're not waiting for budget or permission or not much time, really. Yeah. And you can do that today. And we know from research it helps. The third I'll mention, it's a bigger one to explore, but uh, very important, is workload. And here's a simple way a leader can do this. That's not going to mean you're, you're changing everything. No one can do that. Is asking the team to help together identify one aspect of one part of one process we do that is an irritant. And let's put a microscope, microscope on, on it. Sorry, French, sometimes getting away. Microscope on it to see where we can make this easier. Is there, for example, a process that we do once in a whatever rare amount of time so that whenever we do it, we're all very anxious that we're going to not do it right? What can we do to relax everyone on this? Can we be two peers? Can we have it written better? Can we have any aspect that will actually make an impact on the workload? So these are some examples, but yes, we do want to bring this to our teams because workplace is a system. There's us, the team, the organization, and we want to influence, we actually do influence all of this. Yeah. Those signals that leaders project, those signals are happening all the time. And when they transmit their own frequencies about how they're feeling to others and talk about the things they're doing to help maintain that sense of balance with well-being, you almost feel permissioned to do the same if you're oh, a member of that team. Yes, I've had a leader tell me literally that the person they were leaving work at four saying, I have this spin class I have to get to. So they actually revealed why they were leaving at four. And literally their senior leader said, okay, now hearing this from you absolutely gives me permission to make sure I do it. You've told me before, but now that you've told me this, I know you really mean it. So you're completely mm. right, Joe. Yeah, leaders lead on this issue. I mean, in so many ways, but certainly when it comes to setting the right terms and tone for how people think and feel at work. The book is The Resilience Plan and the author, and I feel like we got a better plan now because of her, is Maria Lean Peltier, MH. Thanks for sharing your wish with us today. Joe, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you.